What? Josh demanded, looking around. The smell was stronger now, stale and bitter, and almost familiar. Snake, Sophie said, breathing deeply. It's a snake. Josh felt his stomach lurch. Snake. Why did it have to be snakes? He was terrified of snakes, though he'd never admit it to anyone, especially not his sister. Snakes? He began, but his voice sounded high-pitched and strangled. He coughed and tried again. <clears throat> Where? He asked, looking around desperately, imagining them everywhere, sliding out from under the pews, curling down the pillars, dropping down from the light fixtures. Sophie shook her head and frowned. I don't hear any. I'm just smelling them. Her nostrils flared as she drew in a deep breath. No, no, there's just one. Oh, do you smell in a snake all right? But one that walks on two legs, Scatty snapped. Flamel knelt on the floor in front of the massive ma main doors and ran his hands over the locks. Wisps of green smoke curled from his fingers. Machiavelli, he spat. D didn't waste any time contacting his allies, I see. You could tell who it is from the smell? Josh asked, still surprised and a little confused. Every person has a distinctive magical odor, Scatty explained, standing with her back to the alchemist, protecting him. You two smell of vanilla ice cream and oranges. Nicholas smells of mint. And D smelled of rotten eggs, Sophie added. Sulfur, Josh said. Which was once known as brimstone, Scatty said. Very appropriate for Dr. D. Her head was moving from side to side as she paid particular attention to the deep shadows behind the statues. Well, Machiavelli smells of snakes. Appropriate, too. Who is he? Josh asked. He felt as if he should know the name, almost as if he had heard it before. A friend of Dee's? Machiavelli's an immortal allied with the Dark Elders, Scatty explained. And no friend to Dee, though they are on the same side. Machiavelli is older than the magician, infant and more dangerous and certainly more cunning. I should have killed him when I had the chance, she said bitterly. For the past 500 years, he has been at the heart of European politics, the puppet master working in the shadows. Last I heard, he had been appointed the head of the DGSE, the Direction Generale de la Securité Expertere. Is that like a bank? Josh asked. Scanny's lips curled into a tiny smile that exposed her overlong vampire incisors. It means the General Board of External Security. It's the French Secret Service. <laughs> the Secret Service? Oh, that's just great, Josh said sarcastically. The smell is getting stronger, Sophie said her awakened senses acutely aware of the odor. Concentrating hard, she allowed a little of her power to trickle into her aura, which bloomed into a ghostly shadow around her. Crackled as lustrous silver threads sparkled in her blonde hair, and her eyes turned to reflective silver coins. Almost unconsciously, Josh stepped away from his sister. He had seen her like this before, and she scared him. That means he's close by. He's working some magic, Scatty said. Nicholas? I just need another minute. Flamel's fingertips glowed emerald green, smoking as they traced a pattern around the lock. A solid click sounded from within, but when the alchemist tried to turn the handle, the door didn't move. Maybe more than a minute. Too late, Josh whispered, raising an arm and pointing. Something's here. At the opposite end of the great basilica, the banks of candles had gone out. It was as if an unfelt breeze was sweeping down the aisles, snuffing out the flickering circular nightlights and thicker candles as it passed, leaving curls of gray-white smoke hanging in the air. Abruptly, the smell of candle wax grew stronger, much, much stronger, almost obliterating the odor of serpent. I can't see anything, Josh began. It's here, Sophie shouted. The creature that flowed up off the cold flagstones was only marginally human, Standing taller than a man, broad and grotesque, it was a gelatinous white shape with only the vaguest hint of a head set directly on her broad shoulders. There were no visible features. As they watched, two huge arms separated from the trunk of the body with a squelch and grew hand-like shapes. Golem! Sophie shouted in horror. A wax golem! She flung her hand and her aura blazed. The ice-cold wind surged from her fingertips to batter the creature but the white, waxy skin simply rippled and flowed beneath the breeze. Protect Nicholas! Skathatch demanded, darting forward, her matched swords flickering out, biting into the creature, but without any effect. The soft wax trapped her swords, 
and it took all her strength to pull them free. She struck again, and chips of wax sprayed into the air. The creature struck at her, and she had abandoned her grip on her swords as she danced backward to avoid the crushing blow. A bulbous fist thundered into the floor at her feet, spattering globules of white wax in every direction. Josh grabbed one of the folding wooden chairs stacked outside the gift shop at the back of the church. Holding it by two legs, he slammed it into the creature's chest, where it stuck fast. As the wax shape turned toward Josh, the chair was wrenched from his hands. He grabbed another chair, darted around behind the creature, and slammed the chair down. It shattered across the creature's shoulders, leaving scores of splinters protruding like bizarre porcupine spines. Sophie froze. She desperately tried to recall some of the secrets of air magic that the Witch of Endor had taught her only a few hours ago. The witch said it was the most powerful of magics, and Sophie had seen what it had done to the undead army of long-deceased humans and beasts Dee had raised in Ojai. But she had no idea what would work against the wax monster before her. She knew how to raise a miniature tornado, but she couldn't risk calling it up in the confined space of the basilica. Nicholas! Scatty called. With her sword stuck into the creature, the warrior was using her nunchaku, two lengths of wood attached by a short chain, to batter at the golem. They left deep indentations in its skin, but otherwise seemed to have no effect. She delivered one particularly fierce blow that embedded the polished wood in the creature's side. Wax flowed around the nunchaku, trapping them. When the creature twisted toward Josh, the weapon was ripped from the warrior's hands, sending her spinning across the room. A hand that was only thumb and fused fingers, like a giant mitten, caught Josh's shoulder and squeezed. The pain was incredible and drove the boy to his knees. Josh! Sophie screamed, the sound echoing in a huge church. Josh tried to pull the hand away, but the wax was too slippery and his fingers sank into the white goo. Warm wax began to flow off the creature's hand, then curl and wrap around his shoulder and roll down onto his chest, constricting his breathing. Josh, duck! Sophie grabbed a wooden chair and swung it through the air. It whistled over her brother's head, the wind ruffling his hair, and she brought it down hard, edge first, on the thick wax arm where the elbow should have been. The chair struck halfway through, but the movement distracted the creature and it abandoned Josh, leaving him bruised and coated in a layer of candle wax. From his place kneeling on the ground, Josh watched in horror as two gelatinous hands reached for his twin's throat. Terrified, Sophie screamed. Josh watched as his sister's eyes flickered, the blue replaced with silver. Then her aura blazed incandescent the moment the golem's paws came close to her skin. Immediately, its waxy hands began to run liquid and spatter to the floor. Sophie stretched out her own hand, fingers splayed, and pressed it against the golem's chest, where it sank, sizzling and hissing into the mass of wax. Josh crouched on the ground, close to Flamel, his hands thrown up to protect his eyes from the brilliant silver light. He saw his st sister step closer to the creature, her aura now painfully bright, arms spread wide, an invisible unfelt heat melting the creature, reducing the wax to liquid. Skathatch's swords and nunchaku clattered to the stone floor, followed, seconds later, by the remains of the wooden chair. Sophie's aura flickered and Josh was on his feet and by her side to catch her as she swayed. I feel dizzy, she said thickly as she slumped into his arms. She was barely conscious and she felt ice cold, the usually sweet vanilla scent of her aura now sour and bitter. Scatty Scoop whooped in to gather up her weapons from the pile of semi-liquid wax that now resembled a half-melted snowman. She fastidiously wiped her blades clean before she slipped them back into the sheaths she wore on her back. Picking curls of white wax off her nunchaku, she slipped them both into her holster on her belt. Then she turned to Sophie. You saved us, she said gravely. That's a death I'll never forget. Got it, Flamel said suddenly. He stood back, and Sophie, Josh, and Skatthatch watched as curls of green smoke seeped from the lock. The alchemist pushed the door and it clicked open, cool night air rushing in, dispelling the cloying odor of melted wax. We could have done a little help, you know, Scatty grumbled. Flamel grinned and wiped his fingers on his jeans, leaving traces of green light on the cloth. I didn't know you had it under control, he said, stepping out of the basilica. Skatatch and the twins followed. The sounds of police sirens were louder now, but the area directly in front of the church was empty. sacre Coeur was set on the hill, one of the highest points in Paris, and from where they stood, they had a view of the entire city. Nicholas Flamel's face lit up with delight. Home! What is it with European magicians and golems? Skatty asked, following him. Forresti now Machiavelli? Has he no imaginations? Flamel looked surprised. 
That wasn't a golem. Golems need to have a spells on their body to animate them. Scatty nodded. She knew that, of course. What, then? That was a tulpa. Scatty's bright green eyes widened and surprised. A tulpa? Is Machiavelli that powerful, then? <laughs> Obviously. What's a tulpa? Josh asked Flamel, but it was his sister who answered, and Josh was once again reminded of the huge gulf that had opened up between them the moment her powers had been awakened. A creature created and animated entirely by the power of the imagination, Sophie explained casually. Precisely, Nicholas Flamel said, breathing deeply. Machiavelli knew there would be wax in the church, so he brought it to life. But surely he knew he would not be able to stop us, Scatty asked. Nicholas walked out from under the central arch that framed the front of the basilica and stood at the edge of the first of 221 steps that led down to the street far below. Oh, he knew it wouldn't stop us, he said patiently. He just wanted to slow us down to keep us here until he arrived. He pointed. Far below, the narrow streets of Monte Marte had come alive with the sounds and lights of a fleet of French police cars. Dozens of uniformed gendarmes had gathered at the bottom of the steps, with more arriving from the narrow side streets to form a cordon around the building. Surprisingly, none of them had started climbing. Flamel, Scatty, and the twins ignored the police. They were watching the tall, thin, white-haired man in the elegant tuxedo slowly make his way up the steps toward them. He stopped when he saw them emerge from the basilica, leaned on a low metal railing, and raised his right hand in a lazy salute. Let me guess, Josh said. That must be Niccolo Machiavelli. The most dangerous immortal in Europe, the alchemist said grimly. Trust me, this man makes D look like an amateur.